one of the things we're talking about is a family connection, our heritage. Mm -hmm. You know, your grandparents are Ray and Charles Eames, who are a phenomena in the design world. So what did you learn from your grandparents? Uh, what is your connection to India through them? The story of India for our family was always, always there. I remember, you know, Ray once said that her favorite music was the sound of the train whistles in Rajasthan. So that's part of our India story. And uh, it starts with my grandparents, Charles and Ray Eames. They came to uh, India in 1958 at the invitation of, uh, of Nehru. And he was kind of concerned about kind of lessening of the quality of things and also sort of how to deal with westernization. For those of you who may not be as familiar with Charles and Ray's work, this is a postcard they sent. This chair, the Eames, they're kind of most famous for furniture. But they had a beautiful and very holistic vision of design. Uh, this is a house that they designed. They came to India. That's my grandmother, Ray. And they traveled for about three months, and they went all over India. They took many pictures. And they're really trying to figure out how to deal with this question that Nehru had raised, which is, you know, how do you deal with modernization without becoming so romantic about the past that you actually can't engage in what's really going on? After a while, they wrote something called the India Report, and that was the document that founded the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad. As this issue kind of unfolded of, of how to do it, they said, you know, first of all, with literally a thousand cultures on the subcontinent, why do you need to look outside? You know, there must be answers here. And one of the answers they were really impressed by was, was this vessel, which is called Lota. Lota is a vessel for carrying water. And the thing that fascinated them about the Lota was that it had been designed by generations of use. And so what that meant is that actually generate, you know, nobody can throw away something like this just because it wasn't working perfectly. But when it didn't work, then you would make it a little bit better. And in a way, through time, it answered all the things you would answer in design brief, the you know, fluid dynamics, uh, the gender of the people that use the user, whether it's hand, all these kinds of things. And so that's kind of an interesting model. And when you think about it, it's a little bit like what design by designers is. Um, that's a way you can use the process that comes very naturally to look to the future. One of the things that um, Meru asked Charles and Ray was, well, what do we do? You know, should we buy a brand new computer? For and Charles and Ray said, no. You're much better off making a really crappy computer yourself, making all the mistakes, but having that learning happen here, because you never delegate understanding. So when, Charles, when Nehru died, they were asked to do an exhibition about Nehru's life. And actually, this exhibit is still at the Pragati Maidan uh, in New Delhi. And what they did is they said, OK, well, we're happy to have the job, but we want to do it with the students of the National Institute of Design. So it was actually one of their first jobs, and it led to this design. So they actually walked the walk and talked the talk. And one little detail is you can see there the sandbags there. And anyone who's ever designed an exhibition knows that traveling is a nightmare because you have to carry all this weight. So what they did is they weighted down all the uh, stands of the exhibition with sand, and then you could pour it out. And when you get to the next location, you could just get some sand. <laughs> That's great. So maybe your sense of uh, design or uh, how to get everybody to participate in their own culture mm -hmm. uh, could have been influenced by them. And the second thing they were very known for is the concept mm -hmm. of Powers of Ten has changed people's perception of scale. So tell us a little bit about that and how it influenced you. So the film you're going to see, I did a Powers of Ten of wine. So you're not going to listen to it. And this is the film that Charles and Ray made. And then what we have here is a concurrent journey through wine. But it's a very good introduction to the concept of scale. And one of the things that I believe very strongly is that scale is the new geography. In fact, if you don't understand scale, it's actually a form of illiteracy in this day and age. And a lot of the things that we've talked about are issues of scale. Um, what we're just hearing about in, in the village, I mean, it has to happen on the, on the individual basis, but it can actually be part of saving some, some amazing things. But if you think about it, we're not very fluent in scale. I mean, we see all these big numbers and we don't really know what they mean, and yet they have very, you know, we're basically involved as a human culture in a giant science experiment right now, which is what happens when you do the same stupid thing a million times a day. Whether it's the chemicals that are coming into the air, whether it's the four species being extinct every 30 minutes, all these kinds of things, and yet we can't really wrestle with it because we almost don't even understand what's going on. So to me, a scale line needs to be as comfortable for people as a timeline or as a map of the world. Yeah, and also, you know, the powers of 10 to me was that, you know, just within 20 steps, you go from, uh, you know, from a body to the universe and from the body to the atom. I mean, it's just, it makes you understand life in such few shorter steps. Now, you know, you have your own version of how you see the world through a parallel universe you have created. Right. So tell us a little bit about this. 
they're very sophisticated people behind the scenes here. Unfortunately, they're not in this chair. So the project I'm working on now is uh, global work of um, multidimensional uh, fiction. And it's called Chimerics there. It's very easy to pronounce. <laughs> and it, uh, it comes Was from, it intentional? You wanted a name that's very difficult to pronounce? No, it actually it came from the cognate word chimera, which means the true physicality of the planet, and an exther, which is a shape with almost an infinity of dimensions or sides, infinity minus 29. So, um, <laughs> so the control of those missing dimensions becomes very important. So I, I'm just, I call myself the geographer at large. I'm just a reporter <laughs> about this parallel world. <laughs> so what we do is we go around the world installing bronze plaques and historic sites that honor events from the parallel world in our world. This is the Museum of the Bench, installed in what we call Abilene, Texas. We have about 89 sites in 19 countries. This is actually the least visited site. It's under 60 feet of water off the coast of Scotland. So um, one of the nice things about, about being involved in a parallel universe is sometimes the land values are still pretty good. So what we did is that we installed um, this plaque, but we also brought about 100 tons of stone there to, uh, to tell the story that happens in that place in the parallel, in the parallel world. Is it you want people to travel through different sites to kind of piece in the story or you want them to experience each location as it is or uh, why are you calling it Parallel Universe and not a book or a novel? Well, it is kind of a novel with every page in a different place. When you read a book and you actually kind of lift out of the page as you read it and you're visualizing the story. But what's really weird, if you think about it, is that your retinas, if you could look at what your retinas are seeing, they're actually seeing the characters on the page. So language is very much a part of perception. So what I want to do is kind of live in that space and use that kind of toolkit to help people see the world differently. So for example, it's very hard when you see a red car to only see the color red because your brain interprets what your eye sees before your mind even knows it. But the downside is you don't see all the things that aren't there. And then you think about everything that people have been talking about it, they're talking about things that some of the things that are, that are there, but they're talking about things that aren't there. And so these things that aren't there are actually very important. So to create a way for people to conjure it up and not take their visual environment for, for granted is, is, pretty, is pretty cool. And, and the other thing about it is that we have this process, and this is a village uh, near uh, Sendwa, which is in uh, Madhya Pradesh. What I do is I tell stories from the parallel world, from chimerics there, to people around the world and ask them to create their own visions of what I've been doing. So if I do a sketch, then even if it's really bad, you sort of figure like, well, he wrote it, of course he knows what it looks like. But if everybody does it, then instead of having clusters of representation, you have clusters of understandings. And that's a very different thing. You know, when we think about, if we had all been born in the UK, you know, 500 years ago, we all would have known who Robin Hood was. What's weird is that we would all have had a different vision of Robin Hood in our heads, but we all would have had this, all of those visions would have been totally different, but they would have enough qualities of Robin Hoodness, whatever the heck that is, to be able to have a common conversation. But today, you know, you, uh, with special effects and all that, you can see everything. You know, Darth Vader is a photograph of a helmet, so we're actually denied the beauty of ambiguity. So what we do is create disputed likenesses with these with the folks. So I worked with the kids in this village and told them the stories, and they did a lot of different renderings, and we made this uh, mural together. Uh, that's cool of Larsa. She's the one who tricked the gods into not helping their believers. But she's, uh, as you can tell, quite an impressive character. By the end of her tricking the gods, she built an Ecclemundi Cruella. So it was one of these things that was built by her telling the story. And so then the kids and I built the five corners of that. Not really the five corners, but kind of a talisman of those quarters. And that's what's there now, and the kids will tell you, be happy to tell you the story. We also did this in Madrid with a group of artists. I'm not sure if you've seen this animal, it's called a nacien. And naciens are seven-legged deer-like creatures, and their prime numbered legs are very nutritious. In fact, if you take one <laughs> bite, it'll sustain you for a month. But if you eat the non-prime numbered legs, um, it's poisonous unto death. Uh -huh. So it's another reason to study math, because the lector of M. Pedraza, um, <laughs> uh, he, was, he thought one was a prime number, and uh, you know we know what happened to him. So. <laughs> We also did that, told that story to a group of embroiderers in Namibia, and they did these versions of the Nasien. So what's nice is that Nasienness is somewhere in between all these things and even what you're imagining in your, in your head. So I worked with the Martha Mwalyu, who founded this right after Namibian Ind uh, independence, and it's a group of embroiderers, went there and told the stories. It took about 10 months, not that I was there the whole time, but we used Skype and things like that. And then this is their version of the Tower of Wisdom. And so you can see, the other thing is that, again, it's another one of these creatures that doesn't get enough effect, but you can see that there's a little, there's a lizard sort of thing 
on the shoulders of this girl. You can see it here on the, in the village. And that's a rock Mary lizard. And these are the only lizards that are um, telepathic. And um, so they can read your mind, which is, is pretty cool. And I just want to kind of wrap up with this idea that, um, of the shared experience, where the, where the truth is kind of between, between all the different versions, um, versions of the story. And so this is back to the, kid, the, uh, the kids' version of it. So yeah. I think you gave a great uh, conversation piece where people come and ask you, how do you come up with these characters? <laughs> so thank you for sharing us uh, with your my, journey. My, my and pleasure. Taking us into the parallel universe. Okay. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. <laughs>